Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm super excited to be here today because I'm amongst friends and nurses. And I always say we have the shift mentality. I probably um, make my staff a little um, hesitant to work with me sometimes because of my pace, right? Because we come in, we do our shift, and we have things we have to check off the list because we have things to do and people to take care of. Um, and so I couldn't think of a better group of people to be with today to help us come away with an action plan. I want to thank Howard as well, um, Ann Beacon and Dr. Sebastian. I had actually started some conversations because of some challenges that we had at the state hospital system. I work at the Division of Behavioral Health and I serve the governor as the director of our division. We're one of six divisions in the Department of Health and Human Services. And we're responsible for funding community-based services for people that aren't Medicaid eligible and don't have insurance. So folks that fall in between that have some significant resource needs. We also um, operate three state hospitals. And our state hospitals really are for individuals that can't be served in the community that they have um, behaviors that are maybe too aggressive or for whatever reason they need um, some additional structure and care at the state hospitals. And so I see our nurses as um, heroes really. They're kind of the psych um, ICU nurses but they don't really get credit for that. And so I know some of them are here today and so I would like all those that have worked at a state hospital or are currently working at a state hospital to stand up. There's some more of you, I see. So thank you for your public service. I'm a nurse that um, started um, my career in um, physical health care. And it was in a small hospital, Osceola, Nebraska. Anybody from Osceola here? And one of the things that I had the opportunity to do was to move to Texas and work in a very large hospital. And it became very apparent to me when I worked on a neuro floor at Dallas Methodist Hospital that people just weren't about their injury or their um, illness that they presented with. There's a lot of healthcare change and recovery principles that go into um, becoming healthier. And I soon moved into behavioral health and I've been in behavioral health for about um, 30 years now. As I um, work for the governor, I always try to share his priorities, and I'm not going to read each one of those, but if you think about his priorities in the context of health and our behavioral health nursing job and action planning we want to do today, we all want to have more efficient and effective service to our customers. He wants it in state government. That is going to involve in healthcare nurses. How do we do processes better, especially with the workforce challenges that we have? What innovations do we have ahead of us? And always having our patients, which is the customer focused. If we're going to grow Nebraska, we want Nebraska to be healthy. We want to be the gold standard for behavioral health and improving public safety. There's a lot of perception, there's a lot of fear and stigma in regards to people with mental illness and substance use disorder. Certainly there are those that need to be served in the state hospital or some other secure setting, but we also have a very high percentage of people that think all mental illness or all individuals with um, chronic <laughs> substance use disorder should be locked away and put away. And so as nurses, we have continued work to talk about when safety is um, uh, when we need to improve it, but also um, give them the bigger picture of individuals with these illnesses. And then certainly today we're trying to look at um, regulation and policy and things that get in the way of us really developing the workforce that we want to. Whoops, wrong one. There we go. So according to the American Nurses Association, here's the definition. Um, for a psychiatric nurse. Now, I think it's interesting in there, so we have mental health, um, we have behavioral health problems and psychiatric disorders. So psychiatric disorders also include substance use disorders and addictions and comorbid conditions. So that's the physical health and all kinds of other things that are part of the people that we have. Could be trauma, um, could be a number of things. On the um, American Psychiatric Nurses Association, they have all kinds of opportunities for people that are interested um, in behavioral health nursing. Look at that long list of great opportunities. 
Now, it also has um, at the top that the APNA is your resource for psychiatric mental health nursing. So one of the things that I think will help our profession is to say who we are and how can we tell our story when we have lots of different terms. So we have psychiatric nursing, and what does that mean to people? We also have psychiatric mental health nursing, behavioral health nursing, and um, we tend to talk about behavioral health in our division um, because it's a statutory phrase, and it means individuals with mental illness and substance use disorders. And then we have nurses. So I want to tell you just two quick examples. I have spoken to a group of school nurses just about behavioral health, kind of a 101 previously. And one of the questions I asked them was, okay, by a show of hands, if you had an individual student that was coming back that was a newly diagnosed diabetic, a person with diabetes, a student, tell me what your treatment plan would be as he enters school. And almost everybody in the room raised their hand that they thought they knew what they could do. Then I said, what about a young student that has lost their mother over the weekend in a car accident? How many of you school nurses would have a plan and know what to do for that student? Less hands. Then I said, now you have a student that's re-entering from either substance use treatment or a psychiatric um, admission where they were suicidal. There were 263 nurses and three raised their hand. So nursing is nursing. So we have some work to do in regards to really treating the whole person. So it's an alarming story of where we are right now. But I'm also here because we're behavioral health, right? Part of our opportunity is to offer people hope for recovery. And so I know we can recover from this workforce challenge that we're at right now with all the innovation in this room. Of all the nurses, if we looked at the N of all nurses in the nation, only about, depending upon which statistic you look at, one to four percent identify themselves as being psychiatric mental health nurses. The average age of an RN is 47 and the average age of a psych mental health nurse is 50. And I actually just read an article last night that it's up to 50.3. So we're gonna be on that next line um, where half are gonna be retiring in about 10 years. Only five to 13% of the psych mental health nursing workforce is under the age of 30. So we're retiring and we're not bringing in as many younger people. There was a study that was done at DePaul University where they looked at um, students that were entering a master's a nursing, psychiatric nursing program, and they um, did a survey of those students to see how well they felt prepared in regards to um, psych mental health issues. And fewer, a very small percentage of those students really felt that they um, had been prepared. Our state hospital RN vacancy rate is 38.7%. And that's better, folks. We have been, these folks, have been working very, very hard. We have agency nurses, and trying to find agency nurses that also have a psych specialty is also a challenge. We have nurses working overtime, and we're not unique. Our percentage may be higher, but I know in a lot of places where you all work, you're also experiencing that shortage. So we really have to come together. We also have the attitudes, stigma, and readiness. So even if people are excited about nursing, we still have attitude, stigma, and readiness out there. And one of the things that I think all of us can do as nurses is to challenge ourselves to be our best ambassadors. So we sit around as nurses at the dinner table talking about all kinds of things that our family members become. <laughs> oh my gosh, they're talking about that at the table. But we do talk about health issues. And we talk about people with cancer. And we talk about the newest and latest um, treatment, um, technology, um, test, medication. And yet, I'm gonna ask each one of you, how many of you have had a recent dinner table conversation about a mental illness or substance use disorder? 
okay? Now, I have asked that same question in many other groups, right? You guys are behavioral health. It is a very, very small percentage. So we have to be leaders. If we can't talk about it and teach and help be our own ambassadors for our profession, we're going to have some challenges. So I challenge you, those of you that are faith-oriented and are going to be going to church this weekend or to a school activity, challenge yourself to start having some of those harder conversations, education, something what you did this week that was really appealing and exciting for you in the field of behavioral health. I think the other thing that um, we talk about in behavioral health nursing is population management. So we're not just talking about individuals, right? We're talking about the opportunity to treat people in the larger context and address health disparities. Because there is absolutely no reason in this great state that where you live is gonna determine when you die. So if you look at this particular Place Matters um, uh, diagram, there is a colored area that um, the map actually looked at poverty level and the um, red um, areas were higher poverty levels. If you look at life expectancy, you can see in the center, it's 63.4 years. This is in Lincoln, Nebraska people. You go to South Lincoln, a few miles away, and the life expectancy there, poverty level is less, is 80.3 years. Go over to the other corner and it's 91.2 years. And yet in the center, which is the lowest, is 63.4 years. And also in there are the mental health calls. So again, the red is the highest. So you put poverty, you put life expectancy, and you put mental health calls. Where do you think we should have our FQHCs or primary behavioral health care centers? See where that blue dot is? That's where they are. But we have a lot of opportunity, again, to think and help people understand that there's really no health without behavioral health. When people with mental illness die younger than the general population, when we have about one in four, one in five of us diagnosed with a behavioral health um, illness, and the sad part is, is that if you look at statistics of those people, so the prevalence rate, only 40% of the folks with mental health get mental health treatment and 12% substance use treatment. Again, we have to be our own great ambassadors. People with mental illness are two times as likely to smoke cigarettes, 50% more likely to be obese, so we have the comorbidity. 25% of hospital admissions are behavioral health diagnosis related, and one in five Medicaid 30-day readmissions to hospitals have a behavioral health diagnosis. Every two hours and 11 minutes, a person under the age of 25 dies from suicide in Nebraska. This is like a golf score, right? Suicide is the, or not like a golf score, suicide is the second leading cause of death in Nebraska for young people ages 15 to 19. And Nebraska has a suicide rate for young people ages 10 to 24, which exceeds the national rate. We have work to do and there's not enough of us, so we gotta figure that out. How do we work together? How do we come up with ideas to really help us move the workforce forward? So what is the state? So um, the Department of Labor um, has all kinds of statistics and I actually probably should have shared their full website because you can get all kinds of things, not just nursing, um, but other occupational data. So maybe I will, Krista or whoever, I will follow up and get some of those additional resources. This is looking at 2014 to 2024, so the long-term occupation projections and this is for nursing. Um, if you look at the categories, total of all occupations in Nebraska registered nurses, so I'm gonna be fo focusing on that second bar, if you will, for registered nurses. So in Nebraska in 2014, the Department of Labor indicated that there's 22,621 estimated registered nurses, okay? In 2024, what they project 
based on economic expansion, um, new positions to um, keep nursing and the health care going, is going to be 25,678. So for those with you with calculators, 25,678 minus that 22,261 is 3,057. So if you look at that registered nurse bar, it's 3,057. So those are growth positions, okay? Then if you look at that projection, and by the way, I might tell you that the growth means that everybody that's doing nursing right now is still in nursing. Okay, those are new based on economic expansion. So then you look at replacement openings. You don't have to raise your hand if you're gonna retire, but we know that there's people that are thinking about retirement. I hope none of you are thinking about changing to a different field. But there are ins and outs of people between 2014 and 2024. So as people leave, they are projecting that that is going to be about 5,337 individuals, which is the other part of that bar. So if you add those, the growth and the replacement openings for nurses together, that's 8,394 nurses. Okay. On the bar graph, the second bar again is the uh, registered nurse. And that's really just looking at the rate of change. Okay, so it's 13.5%. It's also interesting that according to the Department of Labor that nursing occupations have a higher percentage of openings from growth than other positions in the state as a whole. So healthcare is important. So if you look at this next slide, so on the left is the statewide percent of change for those occupations. This is the rate of change for those 8,394 positions. It then breaks it down into regions. So Omaha, Lincoln, Grand Island, Central, Mid Plains, Northeast, Panhandle, Sand Hills, and Southeast. Omaha and Lincoln are above that rate of change. The red bar, 16.4% and 15.1%. So you're going to be looking for even more of that whole position. And then you can see, according to where you live in the state, um, where your percent of change is anticipated to be. The Department of Labor um, also has information about the top 15 industries employing nurses. And one of the great opportunities that we had as we were preparing for this um, and meeting with the Department of Labor is we discovered that they actually hadn't um, been able to get the data share from our DHHS Division of Public Health and the licensure data. And so now we're going to be able to have that data come together to really help us look more specifically. And we also talked about that opportunity. So all of you RNs that are getting your license renewed, and there's always those surveys, I hope people take the time to fill them out because that's the kind of data that we're going to need to be able to really make some data-informed decisions. Um, this is just talking uh, a pictorial of the top three industries employing nurses. So again, not behavioral health nurses. So if you look at the bottom um, registered nurses, 58% is in a hospital employment, which includes private, state, or local. 15% is ambulatory health care. 9% is nursing residential care facilities. And the other, which is the gray, is 18, that says state government, but guess what? It excludes education in hospitals and it excludes our hospitals. So again, we don't have necessarily right now all the great data we need to really focus this in on behavioral health. This is just another top three industries um, employing nurses look. And those of you that are nurse practitioners, there's always data, um, nurse wives, nurse anesthetists, and LPNs. So this last little um, detailed industry employment by degree level, because we talk a lot about education and moving towards 2020 um, with BSN education and so forth and so on. On this top circle for associate degrees, way over to the um, left, the tiny little blue slice and the red slice is where it would touch behavioral health. So that's a teeny tiny portion, folks. 
And then if you look at the bachelor's, which is the big or the triangle circle there where it says bachelor's degree, the tiny little blue slice and the um, below the blue slice, one, two, three, four is kind of a rust colored. Those again are behavioral health. And then on the master's degree, if you look at the blue, light blue section that is, says other health care, that is behavioral health. So we have a small portion of us folks. So you think about nursing as a big old funnel, all nurses, and then you have psych and mental health nurses, and then I say even some specialties within that, and it just keeps getting smaller pieces of the pie. So we are treatment plan oriented. We are strength based, correct? So we have some things. We have an alarming study, but we have great minds in this room to figure this thing out. But what is the strength we can build on? So nursing as a career, a high portion of RNs indicate they would encourage others to choose nursing as a career, 87.2%. Think about your worst day, and people are still <laughs> saying, right, nursing's a great thing. 85% of RNs would do it over if they had the opportunity to choose nursing. So even if they had to do it over, there's that high percentage that are saying they would still do it. So what does that tell us? For me, that tells us that, again, we are own great ambassadors for building behavioral health nursing. We have to be able to figure out how to tell our story. We have to be able to figure out education policy and practice, which is what we're going to do today, to be able to get our message out. If you look over time, 2000 to 2014, and a lot of this data is from the Nebraska Center for Nursing, you look, I mean, no matter how complicated healthcare is getting, and now all the combination with physical and behavioral health, we still have this high percentage saying, yeah, we choose nursing as a career. So now we just gotta bump that up to we wanna choose nursing as a career for those that are interested in whole health and behavioral health will be a part of that. The other thing that was interesting was employment satisfaction for registered nurses. What RNs like most? The patients, the work itself, and the coworkers were the top three people. That should also give us some insight into some of the strategies that will help continue to build the workforce and what satisfaction measures we really need to keep in mind. What RNs like least? Nothing, there isn't anything I don't like, which is interesting. That's almost a third of the people like, hmm. And then salary. And then the hours and schedule. So we know there was a 2014 ANA study um, that Nebraska is one of 10 states with the lowest median salary. One of 10, and guess where we are ranked in the 10? We are eight of those 10, okay? So we have some creative, innovative opportunities to really look at that. Hours and scheduling, I think there are all kinds of opportunities for us to think about how do we get the work done in a different way. What is that opportunity for us to think about flexibility? What are the policy issues? What are the practice issues that will get us where we need to go? I share this behavioral health um, lexicon because we are in the opportunity for integrated health. And on the right hand side is the Sherry Dawson sort of a lexicon. So it's, <laughs> I need my nursing colleagues to help develop this over time. But one of the opportunities we have, I think it's not just in Nebraska, is when we say either psychiatric nursing, psychiatric mental health nursing, behavioral health nursing, that we're not just talking about mental illness. We are talking about mental illness and, sorry, and addictions. And so we have, sorry, <laughs> we have to be able to bring those two things together, which is the bottom part of the triangle. We have mental health care and we have substance use care and we have to bring it together into behavioral health care. Then we fold, okay? Then we fold, then we have it all together. But we can't have primary care docs only screening for depression. We have to have behavioral health care. We have to be screening for addictions and mental illness. And I know who can lead that, nurses. So our bold vision, right, SAMHSA, those of you know SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Service 
Administration. Behavioral health is essential to help. Prevention works. Treatment is effective and people recover. How many of you can identify things on the preventative side for mental illness and addictions? Few, but not as many. And yet when we think about physical illnesses, we're bing bang boom, right? Screenings, doing this, education, all these kinds of things. So we have opportunity again. And on the prevention world, especially on the substance use dis um, disorder side, it's probably the most science-based prevention, evidence-based practice that we have. We know what works. We have that great opportunity ahead of us. And the other thing that we have going for us in our kind of nursing is we are focused on recovery. And recovery means a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. It does not say behavioral health. Recovery is recovery from an illness. And that's the single most important part of where we need to head in the transformation. So I think as behavioral health nervous nurses, it is really all about the outcomes. No matter what kind of a nurse you are, no matter who you're working with in terms of a patient, it really is about having a healthier Nebraska. And there is a cost of us doing nothing, which is why I'm glad we're here today because we're not doing nothing, we are doing something. Lower graduation rates, and that's always linked to poverty level if you look at education and graduation rates. Higher health care costs without early intervention, the cost of deep end services, increased number of juvenile justice and out-of-home placements, and an increased suicide rate. Not to exclude the cost of doing nothing with losing tired and talented nurses, but most importantly, our patients and the people that we serve will not be able to reach their full potential. So the state of nursing and nursing workforce, today I want you to rethink and restart your view of a nurse. I had the opportunity to visit with UNMC Sharon Baker, um, class in Lincoln, um, UNMC Lincoln. And I started my um, talk with them by just asking, so how many of you think you're interested in behavioral health? And I can't remember how many students, a hundred and some, they were in two different rooms. And I think there was about three people that raised their hand. So then I did a lot of the same kind of conversation about there is no health without behavioral health, what behavioral health nurses bring to the conversation with motivational interviewing, with stages of change that apply across, with you take first aid, do you take mental health first aid? You take CPR, do you take QPR, question, persuade, refer, which is for suicide prevention. We talk about trauma. We talk about having people service um, in the culturally and linguistically appropriate way. Behavioral health nurses have so much to offer other nurses. And there truly is no help without behavioral health. At the end of my wonderful going through all the kinds of things, trying to persuade them to think differently about who they are as nurses, I ask them again at the end, so how many of you are interested in behavioral health? More hands. Then I said, how many of you are a behavioral health nurse? And all but a very few raised their hand. They got what nursing and behavioral health nursing is really about and what it's gonna be about. Population management, we've talked about that because we can do better about where people live and helping um, change some health disparities so it really doesn't um, determine when they die. Warm hand across. I think that's one of the things when you're in behavioral health nursing, right? You work with all kinds of folks and the nurse is at the hub. And a lot of times we talk about warm hand offs. So when a person is transitioning from either levels of care or um, from one, um, say their primary care person to their mental health therapist, we talk about handoffs. And handoffs is a word that troubles me because it means you're no longer mine. You're off my plate for right now and you're on to somebody else. 
And the way I think we need to think about it as nurses in a whole health perspective is really it's about a hand across so that that person and their health, no matter what partner you are, we might have different roles, but that patient is still ours. And they may only come at certain times, but it's really about a hand across. So policy, education, practice, I am truly looking forward to today, to learning from you and from learning with you. I can't think of a better group of people. Again, I'm gonna start off with that shift mentality. I know we're gonna have some things to check off. And Howard tells me we have two more of these um, coming, two more years, so action planning is on its way. And if we can talk about Nebraskans um, and nursing in a different way, um, I think we're gonna have better health, and we're certainly better together to make a difference for our patients. So I thank you.